You're listening to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wiseab, and today we're doing Wizard of Oz Part 2, the deep dive to end all deep dives. We're doing the occult analysis of your favorite film of all time. We're going to talk, uh, oh boy, the focus of this episode is going to be on the film itself, right? You probably listened to Part 1, where we set up the ideas for this show, for this uh, analysis. We talked about the characters, the cast, the filming of this thing, and of course the director, who's of course a Luminate confirmed. Now today we're going to get into the film, straight out of 1939. We're going to walk through the whole story. We're going to cover some of the popular conspiracies, the symbolism, as the tale unfolds. This is going to include a deep dive into that song uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, MK Ultra, right? Uh, Pink Floyd, Gene Wilder, little Emil Grande is going to make an appearance. Assyrian mystery religion schools. And that's what the real nuts and bolts of this whole thing is the mystery Babylon religion. We're going, I, I read the book, so we're going to compare the film to the book with some major ideas and symbols that got switched out, and we'll explain that. Ruby Slippers versus the Silver Slippers, a.k.a. the Silver Cord of the Occult. We're going to cover the real meaning of the Yellow Brick Road because it starts out with a spiral. And if you've been on my team long enough, you already know where we're going with that. We're going to, t- we're going to cover alchemy. The Tin Man is the alchemical rebus. We're going to talk uh, asbestos, hanging munchkins, uh, fallen angels, Oz as the fallen angel from the book of Enoch. Oh, yeah, we're going there, folks. Aleister Crowley, Gnosticism, and of course, Dorothy's Hero's Journey. As per Joseph Campbell, this story falls into the same archetypal primordial images. There's so much. There's so much we're going to cover today that we're going to have a part three. The final part of this analysis is going to be part three, where in the conclusion, we're going to wrap up. It's a full in conclusion. Oops, all in conclusion episode where we're going to have to readdress all these ideas because I don't have time to go through each of these ideas as it happens in the show. I'm going to mention them, give you a little taste, and then next week we're going to we're going to deep dive into these ideas. Why it matters. So, I mean, without further ado, let's get into it. If you didn't listen to part one, what are you doing with your life? Go back and listen to part one. I did it last week. I'll put links in the show notes and on the website, yada, yada, yada. Now, I don't know who hasn't seen Wizard of Oz. If you haven't seen it by now, you're never going to see it. If you don't know it by now, you'll never know it. Plot of the film... Dorothy Gale and her dog Toto are swept away by a tornado from their Kansas farm to the magical land of Oz and embark on a quest with three new friends to see the wizard who can return her to her home and fulfill the other's wishes. Just that simple. And, of course, I'll be spoiling the plot, so you've been warned. Cue up (laughs) Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon at the MGM Lion Third Roar and let's go. All right. Fun fact, I did that as a child. All right. I had a black light dark side of the moon poster on my wall. I loved the album then, love it still. And I actually did this one time. Now, being a naive, was I 14 or something? Of course, the album ends well before the movie ends. But the theory is that they synchronized the recording to the Wizard of Oz film to go hand in hand. And there's there's several moments that line up. You could argue it's synchronicity. Pink Floyd denies they did it. Right. But there's synchronicities like Dorothy's walking on the fence and there's lyrics about balancing. They talk about a lunatic on the grass when she meets the scarecrow. Money starts when Dorothy enters the Emerald City. Or is it? She, no, she enters the Land of Oz. I don't remember. But what is interesting is that, you know, Pink Floyd denies that this was done on purpose. So that would mean it's synchronicity. 
because the album was released in 1973. The film, of course, released in 1939. Anyway, interesting ideas. But let's get into the film. Dorothy, she's on the farm. She's in the the old dusty-ass farm in Kansas. It's black and white. She's whining about how this lady named Mrs. Gulch is mean to her dog, Toto. Now, fun fact, the farmhands that she's, I don't know, she lives on this farm. All of those characters that play the farmhands are actually going to show up on the Yellow Brick Road. Ray Balger plays the farmhand hunk. He also plays the scarecrow and so on. And if you listen, he trash talks to Dorothy about how (laughs) she doesn't have any brains. And when he's a farmhand, which is ironically the scarecrow's attribute, that's what he wants. And you'll also notice she lives with her aunt and uncle. Mom and dad are nowhere to be seen. A classic trope. You see it in the Disney films. The argument, of course, the theory presented is that it shows the susceptibility of someone without a family structure to get swept up into the realm of the occult. It comes from an anti-Christian angle. Right, because in in Christ they they want in the church they want you to emulate the nuclear family as much as possible, and in all these films and stuff, all these Illuminate confirmed films, they show you non nuclear families. There's no parents, and the conspiracy is that the government is going to be your parent. That's going to be your big daddy. That's the that's the theory. Now I talked to someone who study did film studies in college she told me that the reason that actually happens is because it simplifies the script writing process to just write out the parents yeah they're dead move on when it's not really relevant to the story apparently hey i don't know so anyway she's on the dusty ass farm and she's she hates it right she hates it And she's just daydreaming about she wants to go to another land and cue up the uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Starts playing, right? Behind the moon, beyond the rain. Somewhere over the rainbow. Now, this song is super illuminate confirmed. It's actually about crossing into a new dimension. And it's very similar to the concepts of Alice in Wonderland. Where the initiate, the viewer, or or, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, the initiate is the viewer, that is you, are going on a journey. You are crossing into a new realm, a new dimension. All right? And that's what Dorothy's about to do. And you'll notice it actually starts out with her saying how... It's far, far away behind the moon, beyond the rain. Right? This is very esoteric. It's literally about a new dimension. And if you look at the lyrics about, you know, she's talking about wishing upon a star, right? And just like Disney, which could be interpreted as, when you say wishing upon a star, it could be interpreted as looking to the stars, looking to the cosmos, reading the stars, astrology, which goes back to the occult Babylonian stargazers of Mesopotamia, where this all started. This is the oldest form of occultism, is astrology. But that's not all. There's a lot more going on with this song, right? Now, as per Wikipedia, the inspiration, right? This was recorded for The Wizard of Oz, obviously. The inspiration was, quote, a ballad for a little girl who was in trouble and wanted to get away from Kansas. A dry, arid, colorless place. She had never been, or no, she had never seen anything colorful in her life except the rainbow. Ooh, shots fired at Kansas. But when you know it, the song was actually channeled. That's right, it was channeled. Like we find with a lot of 
the greatest hits of pop culture, these artists make contact with some other realm and channel lyrics. They are fed directly into them. We talked about this in The Dark Path. Kenneth Grant referred to the realm of creative artistic spaces as the mob zone. It's the dark side of the Kabbalistic tree of life. So, yet again, another example. The song was given to the composer Harold Arlen from entities from another dimension. Muses, if you will. All right. I'm going to read you. Quote, I said to Mrs. Arland, let's go to Grauman's Chinese. You drive the car. I don't feel too well right now. I don't know why I go to get Chinese food if you're not feeling good, but hey, it's 1930s, right? I wasn't thinking of work. I wasn't consciously thinking of work. I just wanted to relax. And as we drove by Schwab's drugstore on Sunset, I said, pull over, please. And we, I'm going to guess he didn't say it like that. It's the 1930s, right? These guys were running running wild back then. Pull over, please. And we stopped, and I really don't know why. Bless the muses. And I took out my little bit of manuscript and put down what you now know as Over the Rainbow. And if you look at the... There's a book called Who Put the Rainbow in the Wizard of Oz by Harold Meyerson and Ernest... Harburg, quote, it was as if the Lord said, well, here it is. Now stop worrying about it. All right. So lyrics channel from another dimension, from the the muses, as he says. Illuminate confirm. Also, the famous Hawaiian version by Israel, I'm about to butcher this one, Kamakawiyawiyawole was recorded <laughs> at when, at when, if you've ever been to Hawaii, which I love, you know, Maui's probably heaven on earth if there ever was a place. And they'll play this song at the airport when you're leaving and you get a little sad. Me and, me and the uh, beautiful Josie Wise have been to Maui twice and both times it was like pulling teeth trying to leave i said i don't want to go this is this is where i want to be now the the locals probably disagree they don't want my my cracker ass (laughs) howly ass over there but i love it but when you leave they play israel kamalakadakadu version of over the rainbow and it's sad and you want to cry but anyway this hawaiian version that you, you you're familiar with was recorded he said he called the studio at 3 a.m. to say he was going to come in and record it. Did it, knocked it out in one take at 3 a.m. in the morning. Huh. Huh. 3 a.m., of course. You know what that means. It's the witching hour. It's the inverted hour of the, the, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, uh, the death of Christ on the cross at 3 p.m. Right, that's supposedly when the devil makes his most appearances is at three a.m. I'm just here to report to you the facts and present a theory. I don't know if it's true. I mean, the song doesn't sound too devilish, does it? Now, fun fact: Gene Wilder made famous from uh, he was Willy Wonka, right? Gene Wilder died while listening to "Over the Rainbow," and it was he said is one of his favorite songs. Uh, the Ella Fitzgerald version. Now, Ariola, <laughs> Ariola Grande, she recorded a version of this song. If you recall, she had a concert in Manchester, and there was a bombing. I don't know, killed some people. She felt real bad. And then in 2017, as a fundraiser, she recorded a version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And also, if you recall, the S-H-O-O-K kids sang over the rainbow at the 2013 Super Bowl, the, the year, the, uh, you know, after the, the thing happened. Right? But why is it Illuminate Confirm? Right? We're just pointing out things and ideas, and it's like, okay, kind of flaky, Isaac, I don't know. Well, I do know, all right? And I'm going to tell you. The theory is that... 
Yeah, and you got to get into MK Ultra, right? MK Ultra, of course, the CIA was doing studies on American soil. By the way, they they uh, say they only do overseas stuff. Anyway, they were they were on American soil, dosing people and seeing how to figure out how to do mind control. And anyways, the theory is that during violent dissociating mind control handling. This song is often played to encourage the victim to mentally cross into another dimension to escape the pain. So you basically torture somebody. Their minds aren't meant to handle the pain or comprehend it. They have to dissociate. When you're traumatized, you have to dissociate. And this song is played to put them in the state of mind to get them to Kansas, basically. Or as Harley Pasternak told Kanye... Put them in zombie land forever. Now you'll see this in the film Face Off. When Nick Cage and family, they're getting shot at. And Nick, well, maybe, I guess it's John Travolta technically, because in the film, you know, fun fact, they literally cut off Nick Cage's face and they put it on John Travolta's face. And, and of course, now, you know, Nick Cage can dance like in Staying Alive. <laughs> no, I meant Staying Alive, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. Anyway, uh, Nick or John, they put the headphones on, and um, this uh, little kid, right? So, so there's all the shooting going on, and they take the headphones, and they put on this little kid, because the little kid's like, oh, man, I'm about to get shot up, right? And they're trying to distract him, trying to dissociate him from the trauma. And guess what song is playing? You already know. Somewhere over the rainbow. Which adds a weird darkness to the S-H-O-O you-know-what thing. When those kids came out and sang it at the Super Bowl. Anyway. Uh, Fritz Springmeier. He wrote a book about how to con- how to create mind control slaves. It's a longer title than that. I don't remember the whole title. And he claims that over the rainbow is a term used in mind control practice. He says that some altars live over the rainbow and some do not. Both types will use the term over the rainbow, but with different meanings attached. For those who live over the rainbow, they serve their masters in such a deep hypnotic trance that they perceive reality like it's a dream. When their memories surface, they are so unlike normal memories that a system in therapy may not know what to do with them. They have been described as similar to the pictures in the old TVs with, when the vertical hold would go out of control. Deeper alters who live over the rainbow experience memories and life in the following fashion. Faces and porn cameras are airbrushed out of their memory. Distinctive marks in the perpetrators such as scars and wrinkles are airbrushed out. Colors and lights are very bright due to the total dilation of the pupils. While in deep trance, and there is no sense of time for these altars. These altars are trained to trance, send forward through time. By understanding the programming, the codes and triggers, those whose altars live over the rainbow can recover from the mind the full memory without the distortions created by dissociation. Now, what's he saying? He's saying that much like in Face Off, They need to send the kid's mind to another realm away from the trauma. They do this in the mind control experiments to create alters, permanent alters, different personalities. Now, what's interesting, uh, Judy Garland, who plays Dorothy, told the Minneapolis Sunday Tribune back in 1951. She said, and I quote, Actors live in a queer sort of double world. Not many of us have the names or identities we were born with. I don't associate Frances Gum with me. She's a girl I can read about the way other people do. I, Judy Garland, was born when I was 12 years old. So what she's saying is, and, and her, her original, her real, her birth name was Frances Ethel Gum. And of course she took on the name Judy Garland she effectively created an altar when she was 12, which is what you see. A lot of these child celebrities, they go through this process. 
You see the idea of altars created with magical names as well. The, the occult magicians do this too, so they understand it in a way when they create a magical name. Bryce Taylor, another theorist that talks about MK Ultra stuff, has a book called Thanks for the Memories. And in it, she claims that she was a programmed sex slave for Bob Hope and Henry Kissinger. Claims she was forced to participate in the, a similar dissociation. She said, and I quote, Sometimes in the middle of the night, after having watched The Wizard of Oz, my father would traumatize me in order to cause me to dissociate, which created the perfect trance state for programming. In this altered state, he would tell me that over the rainbow was a bridge to the other world, and that I could walk over the rainbow bridge into the other world, and it would remain separate from my everyday world. He told me that what happened over the rainbow would feel unreal, like a dream. After encounters that I was supposed to forget, I was conditioned to the word home. It began with, there's no place like home being associated with being back in my bed, sleeping after a night of being used in child pee or prostitution. Is she telling us the truth? I certainly don't know. But if you look at the CIA history of MKUltra, we have to consider it, right? We have to consider it. Especially if you look at Chaos, which is the Charles Manson book by Tom O'Neill. It directly ties a lot of this stuff together in a very similar fashion that they were programming him. And uh, uh, Kathy O'Brien wrote a book called Transformation of America, mentions the same concept also. So all these people are just making it up out of thin air. Okay, I believe it, right? I believe it. And oh, by the way, this connects into Oz when we consider that Bobby Beausoleil, a member of the Manson family, was also a member of Kenneth Anger's house band called Magical Powerhouse of Oz. Right? Kenneth Anger, a Crowley acolyte, uh, he filmed Lucifer Rising and all these like crazy occult films in the 60s. And there was a band, the Magical Powerhouse of Oz, that were supposed to play on these on uh, Lucifer Rising, and uh, there's a bunch of problems that happened. I don't know. But anyway, Bobby Beausoleil, a member of the Manson family, the first one to get arrested, I believe. Was he, was he the one that got arrested for the murder of Bo, uh, Gary Hinman? i got to refresh my Manson ideas. But anyway. So yeah, Charles Manson, allegedly also part of an MK Ultra type mind control assassination cult killer group. And... Of course, we also have Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, which is chocked full of over-the-rainbow symbolism. My God, we're going to hit that in the conclusion because we got to move on. It's a, it's a big movie, right? All right, so she's singing over the rainbow. Then uh, cue up the witch music. Here comes Miss Gulch. And she shows up and she's saying how, oh, Toto bit me and she's going to sue if they don't give Toto over to get destroyed by the sheriff, they say. And Dorothy's dumb parents, or aunt and uncle, I should say, they fall for it, and they make Dorothy give up Toto. But you know what? Dorothy's not going out like that. (laughs) She won't do it. And she calls Mrs. Gulch a wicked old witch. Fun fact is because she is. And we also find out that Mrs. Gulch is an elitist. She owns half the county, is what we find out. You know, these creeps with all the money, the elitist, she's Mrs. Gulch is 100 percent in the World Economic Forum. If that movie is made in 2023, that's all I'm saying. Now, Aunt M and Uncle Henry. They proceed to snatch Toto up. Even though Dorothy tried to save Toto, they snatch him up. They throw him in Mrs. Gulch's basket because they're awful people. Worst family ever. You'd have to pry my dog from my cold, dead hands. You know, if he bit someone, maybe they deserved it. That's all I'm saying. And Ms. Gulch clearly deserved to be bitten. But Toto, he escapes the basket and runs back to Dorothy. No thanks to her beta cuck aunt and uncle. 
And now this is, again, traumatic for a child. There is, and, and I, I try to find the reference. There is a reference, and I remember talking about it in one of our shows the last couple years, that claims are made that the people that do this kind of MK Ultra dissociation horrific abuse stuff of kids, that is something they do is show them the, the murder of animals or even their own animals. So this is very traumatic, you know? And I remember as a child watching Wizard of Oz, I was scared of Mrs. Gulch. You know? Maybe we all went over the rainbow a little bit with that with that traumatizing scene. So Dorothy, she's got Toto, and she's roaming about, and she sees this guy, Professor Marvel, and his shanty. And he's a crystal ball reader and a fortune teller, which are... Occult practices, okay? And they have a conversation. She, He pulls her into his shanty, and take a listen to what he says. Hey, now, let's see, where were we? Uh? Oh, please, Professor, why can't we go with you and see all the crown heads of Europe? Do you know any? Oh, you mean the thing. Yes, uh, well, uh, I, uh, I never do anything without consulting my crystal first. Let's uh, go inside here. We'll uh, just come along. I'll show you. That's right here. Sit right down here. That's it. <laughs> this, uh, this is the same genuine, magic, authentic crystal used by the priests of Isis and Osiris in the days of the pharaohs of Egypt, in which Cleopatra first saw the approach of Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony and, uh, and so on and so on. Now, uh, you, uh, you'd better close your eyes, my child, for a moment in order to be better in tune with the infinite, we... Uh... You hear him say it comes from Osiris and Isis. All right? This is my red pill sensei, Bill Cooper, Occult 101, his mystery Babylon teachings. He says Osiris and Isis, they're not real people. They are symbols. Symbols of the occult great work. The great work, right? That's the master plan. That's the the evolution of man into their false utopia. And this all goes back to Plutarch. And the Osiris and Isis psychodramas of Egyptian plays. And Plutarch said, you know, this Isis character in the plays, in the dramas, stands for knowledge. And knowledge, of course, is the gnosis. And this is where it ties into the occult religion or belief system of Gnosticism. And wisdom and the Sophia. And Osiris is personification of the Order of Learning, capital O, the Order of Learning. And Plutarch calls him the... the He's the holy doctrine, the holy tradition of these occultists. of this, Because Osiris represents the sun, S-U-N. Because the sun is worshipped as the symbol of God's power. It represents the prim- primordial knowledge, the intellect. And that's what they're, that's what they're truly worshipping, is man's intellect. Because they think they can free all of mankind by using the mind's that ironically God gave us to defy their creator. That's why they try to warm you up to these adversarial characters and these Luciferian uh, archetypes to rebel, rebel against your father. But yeah, it's all allegorical. Intellect will allow man to become God. That's their fantasy. And Osiris embodies the sacred wisdom of ancient rituals. Because Thoth uses ritual magic to bring Osiris back to life. He is the dying and resurrecting savior figure, okay? Osiris is the story of life, death, resurrection, and man's capability to achieve apotheosis without God, without the Christian God. Osiris represents the esoteric wisdom and... Uh, the body of all the initiates who understand this. They, uh, Bill Cooper does a good job of explaining. He says, Osiris is the doctrine 
Isis is the church and the body of all the initiates, the great mother, right? So that's when you when you see the symbolism. They're not talking about literally the guy Osiris and literally the goddess Isis, right? Um, but they use symbolism to reference this idea. Osiris is symbolized by the sun, masculine energies, the pole of philo- philosophy, and Isis is represented by the moon, the female, the bride, the receiver. That's why when we talked about the 2023 Grammys and the massive occult ritual that was, it was on the full moon. We saw symbolism of the moon and symbolism of the goddess throughout. Now, what's fascinating is that Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon syncs up at this point of the movie and says, when they talk about Osiris, which I just rambled on and on about being symbolized by the sun, it syncs up to the part of the song that says, uh, I don't remember which track it is, the sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter in breath. One day, closer to death. You're welcome. (laughs) The sun is Osiris. And the talk about approaching death, the death and the resurrection, and it syncs up at the same point of the movie. Now, Pink Floyd tells us and assures us they did not plan for this to happen this way, so maybe it is synchronicity. Very strange. Because, again, the sun is... Is symbolized as Osir- Osiris is symbolized as the sun. He is the dying, resurrecting God. And not to mention, we're not even going to mention that the guy's name is Professor Marvel. And Marvel ties us into the occult beliefs of superheroes. I did a whole presentation on this two years ago or something like that. That's what it's all about. And Helena Blavatsky and Theosophy and these ideas of the Superman and Frederick Nietzsche and Hitler and oh, all wow, so much. It's so much. This is what they want to pursue. This is what they want man to become God through their nonsensical science. And I'm a science guy, right? Like science helps us. But they want to use it for some other nefarious ends that aren't going to work anyway. So he tells. Captain Marvel or whatever <laughs> tells her some BS fortune, right? Because he's a total grifter, total shill. And she heads home. And she's like, okay, cool. Thanks, bro. She goes back home to the farm. Uh, and here comes a, a tornado. It's just wrecking shop. It turned the dust bowl into the dustier bowl. And Dorothy, she's in her room. And she sees all kinds of wackiness. The house is spinning in the tornado. Mrs. Galt, she's turned into the Wicked Witch at this sequence. Dorothy is burying her head in fear. And this is very important. This is the moment of traumatic fear inducing her altar. Making her go over the rainbow. She's going over the rainbow. We're going to hit that in part three, though. All right? Stay tuned. So Dorothy wakes up, metaphorically, to the concepts of the occult. She is you. You are the initiate. You are waking up to the philosophies of the occult through this film. So she wakes up. She exits her house. And bam. Beautiful colors everywhere. She's now in full technicolor. Because what a wonderful world it is when you go over the rainbow to the occult fantasies. Is what they say. Now, contrary to claims, this was not the actual first Technicolor film. There was a couple before. This is the most popular first one to, to uh, you know, get it on and popping. But it was an early technology still. And so anyway, she's in the land of Oz. And, of course, it looks amazing compared to dusty-ass Kansas. And this is where she drops the classic line, Toto... I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We must be over the rainbow.
But the next line is just as important. After she says, Total, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. She says, we must be over the rainbow. Confirming she has, in fact, transcended the threshold into a new dimension. Now, the book, if you read the book, it describes how the grass wasn't even green and the paint on the house was all beat up because the sun was so brutal. All right. So again, a reference to the sun and its power. When it's talking about the her home in Kansas, right? Now, she gets out of the, the house and we meet the good witch, Glinda, the witch of the north. And she shows up in this orb, this sphere. And she says, hey, congratulations. You killed the wicked witch of the east because... You know, there she is. Her, her feet are dangling out of this house. It smashed her to bits. And Dorothy, of course, had nothing to do with it, but she's like, oh, okay. And Glinda, she asks Dorothy if she's a good witch or a bad witch, and, and Dorothy's confused. She's like, I'm not a witch. And Glinda is like, only bad witches are ugly. Whew. That's cold. Shots fired at all the bad witches out there, apparently. Um. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Her sister was a witch, right? And what was her sister? A princess. The Wicked Witch of the East, bro. <laughs> That's, uh... She wore a crown and came down in a bubble, Doug. Grow up, bro. That's, uh... That's another great performance by Isaac. I don't know if you've seen the viral video. You gotta watch it. It's great. There's a viral video about an argument about the witch <laughs> from uh, Wizard of Oz. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. Take a look. Um, anyway, so she comes out. They're having this conversation. And boom, here come the munchkins. They're singing and dancing. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Uh, with lyrics like, you killed her so completely that we thank you very sweetly. Like, what the hell's wrong with these munchkins? Now, in the book, there's an interesting statement by the good witch. She says... Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries, I believe there are no witches left, nor wizards, nor sorcerer, sorceresses, nor magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized. For we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards among us. So, the idea of the witch, right? If you just watch the film, I mean, it's a role, but not too big of a deal. But when you read the book, you see how L. Frank Baum was really into this occult concept of witches and wizards and warlocks and stuff. It plays a more prominent role in the book. Now, a fun fact, the munchkins were apparently very naughty. They were wiling out, and the claim is that they were staying together at the Culver Hotel. They would get drunk, have munchkin orgies. Uh, some were sexually assaulting Dorothy or uh, Judy Garland putting their hands up her dress and stuff. And also there is a rumor about, I don't know, should I cover this now? All right, let's just cover it now. Uh, there's a rumor that a munchkin hangs themselves on the set in the background. It's the point where they pick up the Tin Man and skip down the Yellow Brick Road into the woods. Uh, but then... You know, the official claim is that, no, 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 it's a bird. And it's not necessarily true. There's an original collector's VHS tape that shows what seems to clearly look like a munchkin. Uh, I will put my in the images on Instagram. You can look for yourself. The There was a version, and, and here's where it gets complicated. Someone apparently, the claim is that someone doctored the footage from the old t from the scene to make it look like a munchkin being hanged. I don't know, but I saw on uh, if you watch Cursed Films two on Shutter, this Wizard of Oz nerd puts in a VHS tab and he plays it. And I'm like, bro, that ain't doctored, man. Like that looks like like a, a munchkin being hanged. So look, I I don't know if it's true. I believe it's true. <laughs> uh. But they definitely changed the film for some reason and put a bird in there. 
Why would they change it? The claim is that they changed it because people came up with this conspiracy theory and it kind of did look like a munchkin. So they said, well, let's let's make it a little more clear that it's a bird. So, you know, believe with it what you desire. So anyway, the Wicked Witch, she shows up. She's looking for the ruby slippers, but Dorothy's got them on, right? And you hear how there's the smell of sulfur when she's around, a common trope for evil, particularly the devil. And in the book, these ruby slippers are not ruby at all. They are silver. And there's a claim that it was referring to the unification of silver and gold and the Yellow Brick Road, right? putting silver onto the gold. And the ruby, um, the ruby, the idea of ruby slippers for the film was probably derived from the Witch of the North in the book, uh, Galet, because they reference Galet in a, quote, handsome palace built from the great blocks of ruby. That's what it says in the book. Now, fun fact, Galit was sad <laughs> in the book. It literally says this. She was sad because she never found herself a man because men were too stupid and ugly. Nobody's safe in the Wizard of Oz. Everyone's getting the smoke. So the silver, the allegation, the theory, is that silver could have been used to sim- by L. Frank Baum, who, again, if you listen to my part one, was a theosophist and a cultist. And he could have made them the slipper silver in the book because of what they call the silver cord. The silver cord connects one's physical material realm to the spiritual realm, right? Just like from Kansas to Oz, in a way. Going over the rainbow, maybe. I don't know. Uh, if you go to... A Vigilant Citizens article, and VC cites a book called Finding Oz. And in the book, Finding Oz, it says this. In theosophy, one's physical body and one's astral body are connected through a silver cord, a mythical link inspired by a passage in the Bible that speaks of a return from a spiritual quest or, or ever the silver cord be lucid says the book of Ecclesiastes, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. In Frank Baum's own writing, the silver cord of astral travel would inspire the silver shoes that bestow special powers upon the one who wears them. Uh, And again, this is from uh, Evan Schwartz, Finding Oz, how L. Frank Baum discovered the great American story. If you watch the Dark Journalist's video on Wizard of Oz, it's like a three-hour dive into it. Dark Journalist claims this is an alchemical process. The silver cord is a reference to the psychic threshold of the pineal gland or the third eye. Um, But if you look at Ecclesiastes 12.6, the silver cord is mentioned, and it talks about youth fading away and the body dying while the spirit ascends back to God. So it seems very likely that there is something to consider here, right? Uh, if you look at Tex Mars's codex, what's it called? Codex Magica. Um, there's a book he has on symbolism. He says silver is the metallic element for guess who? The ancient goddess Isis. So here we are revisiting Osiris and Isis again. Um, and you know, the whole, the whole film is really about the power of the females, the female goddesses here. It's a, you know, the, the men, the men ain't shit. Oz ain't, <laughs> what's he doing? Lying. Uh, Rudolf Steiner said that women, if you read, uh, this was interesting. If you go to Rudolf Steiner's Atlantis and Lemuria book, he talks about how women from Atlantis were the first to develop memory because they have a natural psychic ability, like a natural sixth sense, which I find to be true in my day-to-day life. He said, Women sense the forces of nature and being imbued with these forces, the influences us... Oh, boy. (laughs) Okay, let me start over. Women sense the forces of nature 
and being imbued with these forces, the influences thus derived left an impress on their souls. This gave the first seed for memory, and with memory, the first and most primitive form of a moral idea began to take shape. Now, Dark Journalist also says it's believed that Oz is the name of a lost continent of Atlantis as well. So that ties in nicely with the Atlantis theory of silver. Uh, Of course, you know, silver being the reference to Isis, being the reference to goddesses, being the reference to this story. Women coming from Atlantis and so on. Now, what's interesting is that Aleister Crowley, the famous occultist, had a magical order called Argentum Astrum, also known as AA, not the same as the Alcoholics Anonymous or or whatever. Uh, But in Latin, Argentum Astrum actually means silver star. He also called it the Illuminati. It was meant to advance a human towards perfection, which is kind of what Dorothy's hero's journey goes through. And the initiate would try to complete the great work. And the silver star Crowley was referring to was actually serious. And Crowley said the order of the silver star was actually the Illuminati, and the initiate is meant to eventually cross the abyss, reach Babylon, and become what he called the Babe of the Abyss, reborn as the master of the temple with a perfect understanding of the universe. Seeking the wisdom, right? There's the wisdom again, the Osiris. Um, And, of course, the ruby ruby shoes is an interesting one because uh, of the Red Shoe Club conspiracy. uh, the, The theory is that the royals and Hollywood elites... And politicians, they wear red leather made from actual human flesh. And these people that are in this club, they're into human trafficking and eating kids and all kinds of stuff. It's an angle of the the Wayfair, you know, thing, right? So anyway, Dorothy, <laughs> she, she says... You know, I need to go to the Emerald City by following this Yellow Book Road so she can see the Wizard of Oz, so she can get back to Kansas, and she's not allowed to take the ruby slippers off because the witch is going to catch her. So she keeps them on. Now, we start the journey, and the journey starts with the Yellow Brick Road, but in the film, as you'll see on the image I will provide to you on Instagram, the Yellow Brick Road starts off as a spiral. That's right. It's a spiral. Now, the spiral is very important. It's symbolic of this evolution that the occultists want to take us down. She's about to go on a transform, uh, transformative journey. She goes from the realm of the physical into the cosmos, over the rainbow, and into the new world. And the road that she is now taking is a spiral symbolizing her evolution and her path to enlightenment into the occult sciences to the wisdom the road and the tornado are symbolic of this evolution that she goes on there are spirals symbolizing the ascension of her consciousness right she's going up the cabalistic tree of life towards god and the spiral forces show up in occultism, right? A tornado is a product of the Earth's opposing polarities of warm and cold air. Dorothy rises up in the cyclone to symbolize the rising energy of the kundalini up the spine, right? This is referred to as the center pillar in the Kabbalistic tree of life, as depicted on the Baphomet as the caduceus, the staff of Hermes, with the spiraling serpents climbing it. These are all occult references to the ascension of consciousness, of man becoming God. Got me all fired up, I'm spitting. The Mystic Secrets of Oz on Daniel Gautier's YouTube channel claimed that, I told you, I I consumed a lot of uh, different sources to complete this analysis, folks. 
But on that one, he says that the spiral purposefully chose three different colors, which it does. It's not just yellow. It's red, gray, and yellow. And you see that on the image at the beginning of the spiral. Red symbolizes fire and masculinity. Gray symbolizes the, the moon, lunar, water, feminine. And the yellow is the middle of the two, the androgynous or the middle pillar. And we're going to come back to that androgynous idea with the Tin Man. So Dorothy, she first meets the Scarecrow. Right? She's on a journey. She's on the Yellow Brick Road. We're going to speed this up now. She first meets the Scarecrow, and he says, oh, you know, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. <laughs> and I'm like, maybe this guy has a brain after all. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And he joins Dorothy because he wants the wizard to give him a brain. And he says he'd face a whole box, a whole box of matches for a chance to get some brains. A statement that doesn't age well. Uh, as you know, the term, well, I'm not going to get into it. Look it up on Urban Dictionary. So Dorothy grabs a red apple on the journey. Could it be any more symbolic? She's eating a red apple. This is, of course, the forbidden fruit of knowledge. And, you know, you know, Scarecrow wants the brains. He wants the wisdom. And Dorothy is eating from the tree, the red apple. And we'll find out that Dorothy is the Sophia of wisdom. That's, again, that's a part three topic. So stay subscribed to the show. You're not going to want to miss part three. If you made it through part one and two, don't don't give out on me yet. Dorothy then meets the Tin Man. He wants a heart. Now in the book, he relays a story about how he was going to marry a munchkin. That's right. Those munchkins are freaks, I'm telling you. Uh, the Tin Man met a munchkin. The munchkin turned him out. And he was like, I got to look. I'm putting the cuffs down. We're getting married. But then the witch put a curse on his axe, and he accidentally cut off his leg. Oops. Then he accidentally cut the other leg off, then the arm, <laughs> then the other arm. And then uh, he had the tinsmith create new arms and legs for him, right? Then he cut off his own head. That's right. He cut off his own head. Now, another idea we could throw in the mix here. The uh, five percenters, when they reference Allah, their God, they will say arm, leg, leg, arm, head. Huh? I believe that's on a Wu-Tang track or Jay-Z or something like that. Anyway, let's read from the book, because this is where the alchemy comes in. He says, I thought I had beaten the Wicked Witch then, and I worked harder than ever, but I little knew how cruel my enemy could be. She thought of a new way to kill my love for that beautiful munchkin maiden and made my axe slip again so that it cut right through my body, splitting me into two halves. Once more, the tinsmith came to my help and made me a body of tin, fastening my tin arms and legs and head to it by means of joints so that I could move around as well as ever. But alas, I had now no heart. That's how he loses his heart, right? Because he becomes the alchemical rebus. So then I lost all my love for the munchkin girl and did not care whether I married her or not. Interesting symbolism here, folks, because in alchemy, that is the rebus. It's the person with the two heads you'll see on our chemical artwork. It's the final stage of the great work. Because rebus in Latin means double thing. And in alchemy, one goes through all these stages of purification, distillation, Boiling down oneself to its basic constituents, purifying that basic matter, and reassembling it. Which results in the rebus, the divine hermaphrodite. Because it successfully reconciles spirit and matter, reconciling male and female. And you'll see this, they'll reference it as the philosopher's child. And the parents are the red king and the white queen. You'll see it symbolized as the double-headed eagle. The, it's complicated, right? But the takeaway here, in the book, he is the alchemical rebus. That's why he misses the heart, because he 
lost it when he sliced himself in half. So anyway, here comes the witch. She hits him with some fire. She takes off. And she says that she's going to use the Tin Man as a beehive, which I found interesting because the symbolism of the Freemasons is the beehive. I live in Utah, and the LDS Mormon folks here symbolize the beehive and the bees constantly. It's all over the place. It's on the flag. It's on every little building downtown. They love it. Well, it goes back to the occult. Because Joseph Smith, well-trained in the uh, Freemasonic philosophies, knew all this. And if you take it all the way back, the bee is symbolic for magic. You see how it's all connected? <coughs> I hope you do. Now, they're, they're walking through the forest, talking about lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. I had to do it. And we meet the cowardly lion. Now, my beautiful wife, Josie, she said that they actually killed lions to make this suit for the lion. And I said, no way. And I look it up because I didn't believe it. I looked it up, and sure enough, they did. Worse yet, not only did they kill lions for this movie to make this suit, they made a second one. They made a backup costume. <laughs> Wild. Peter would not be happy. And these suits, they weighed like 90 pounds, which is pretty nuts. So anyway, so now she's got the whole crew together. She assembles her crew, and they're walking around. They go to a poppy field, which, of course, is where you get the opium and the heroin and stuff. And they get snowed on. Turns out that was asbestos in real life. Oops. And what's interesting is in the book, they have to cross a river. And the scarecrow gets stuck because he's not going to go in the river. And a stork helps fly him over. And again, another alchemical reference here, because the white bird is actually the pelican, but you could argue it's a stork here. It's the second stage of the process. The white bird symbolizes the essences left over after the distillation, the basic constituents, the prima materia, they call it, the prime matter. So the they're, they're walking around. They made it over the river, right? They're singing this song that's actually titled Optimistic Voices. They're headed to the Emerald City. And then the lyrics, the lyrics go, you're out of the woods, you're out of the dark, step into the sun, step into the light. Now, you know where we're going with that. Uh, we talked about all the different kinds of lights, but the light is also symbolic of wisdom or enlightenment. And it's all Luciferian when you get down into it. And in fact, when they make it to the Emerald City Gate, you got to look at this image I'll, I'll put out there. When they make it to the gate, you see a falling star on the Emerald City Gate. The fallen star, of course, Lucifer. You know, hey. So they're in the Emerald City. And the witch, she's still messing with them. She puts some... Uh, smoke messages in the sky. It says, Surrender, Dorothy, which is a uh, tattoo Dave Navarro has, right? My old friend Dave Navarro. I haven't spoken to him in so long. I wish he would reach out. But anyway, so they get in there, right? And they talk to the guard. They talk to the guardian of the Emerald City. And they say, look, we want to we talk to Oz. And he says, nobody's seen Oz. And Dorothy's like, how do you know there is one? And it's all about questioning God. How do you know there's a real God? Uh, they're questioning the nature of God and all of the the Abrahamic or monotheistic religions that tell you there is one true God. Take a listen. Now, straight your business. We want, we to, want to see the wizard. The wizard? <laughs> the wizard. <sighs> But nobody can see the great Oz. Nobody's never seen the great Oz. Even I've never seen him. Well, then how do you know there is one? Because he's the... I don't... You're wasting my time. Oh, oh, please. Please, sir. I've got to see the wizard. The good witch of the north sent me. Prove it. 
She's wearing the ruby slippers. She gave her. So the guard tells them that the Wizard of Oz wants them to go home. And they get all sad about going home. The guard's spying on them, and he sees them crying. All right? And he recommits. He's like, all right, I'm going to get you in to see the wizard. And what this is, is this a ritual to see if you're actually committed. Right? And this is like uh, like in Fight Club. Remember in Fight Club? They, they yell at people that show up on the porch, and they're like, you're too fat, fatty. They want to make sure you're committed to be a real initiate here. So the guard opens up the door. They go down this corridor. They're going down the path. They're headed towards the inner sanctum within the inner sanctum. All right. Now, it's interesting because before they go to see Oz, they have to be washed up, right? And to be, they go to the wash and brush, it's called, in Emerald City. You know, they're getting all fresh to see the wizard, right? And there's this really bizarre messaging that I haven't, I don't know that I've got a good theory on it, but I'm going to throw it out there. There's, you see them getting cleaned up, and you see, for no reason at all, it says Super X and XX. And the Tin Man is being sort of massaged by this big wheel with a massive X on it. What does it mean? Well, in Gematria, X is considered the number six. Because when you boil down, like, Fox, F-O-X... When you boil that down, it's 666, right? Because gematria numerology is all about reduction of the number to the basic form. Sounds very alchemical, if you ask me. But you could also argue X represents the unknown. X also, if you read Tex Mars's Codex Magica book, represents Osiris, <laughs> the dying and resurrected god. That's right. The skull and crossbones, same thing. In Roman numerals, X is the number 10. And not so ironically, the number 10 on the Kabbalistic tree of life, the 10th Sephirot, is the highest realm. It's where God resides. Very interesting. Kether, I think. Keter. So ideally, Wizard of Oz, he is the top Sephirot. He is the God. Because Keter means crown. He is the crowned God. And then in the Zohar, it refers to as the most hidden of all things. So you put all that stuff in a blender. I think that's maybe what the X's mean. I don't know. Just my just my my uh, hot take on it. So they finally get in. The wizard says, I am the great and powerful Oz. And he's the all-knowing. Because he already knows why they came to him, he says. And he proves it by rattling off what each person came to get from him. So they're they're convinced. They're like, damn, this guy is great and powerful, right? And I was like, look, if you bring me the witch's broomstick, I will grant you these requests. And what's interesting is in the book, Oz tells Dorothy, I'm going to need you to kill the Wicked Witch of the West since she was able to kill the Wicked Witch of the East. Right? Remember that? Because he's like, look, you, you killed her and you took her shoes. Take care of the other witch. And also in the book, the Wicked Witch of the West only has one eye, right? There's the symbolic of the all-seeing eye, the pineal gland, the third eye of the occult. So, the witch, um, you know, she gets, she snatches Toto up. She hates this dog. And she gets Toto and Dorothy into the castle because the witch wants those ruby slippers. Dorothy's not having it. The parallel to Mrs. Gulch taking Toto is evident here. The witch says, yeah, that's right. You have to die so I can get these shoes. And she puts a spell on Dorothy. And she's like, look, when the sand runs out, you're dead. And, I, and I'm taking your shoes. So the fellas, they all head to the castle because they're trying to save Dorothy. And on this journey, they ironically, they actually start to know thyself You know, because the lion faces danger and turns out he's pretty brave. The scarecrow has to use his mind and turns out he's pretty smart, you know, because he he learned he figures out to chop down this chandelier to stop the the witch's guards so he can get in there. And the witch, they finally get this big confrontation and the witch says, how about a little fire scarecrow? (laughs) And lights his ass on fire. Uh, But Dorothy, she puts it out with a bucket of water. But that water splashes the witch, and it kills her. She melts. 
and the guards, they switch sides just that quick, and they pledge allegiance to Dorothy. She's now their master. And what's interesting is in the book, she, uh, the witch sends 40 wolves to attack the boy, the fellas that are trying to save Dorothy. Uh, the Tin Man, he annihilates these wolves, though. He's, he's the axe man, you know what I mean? And then she sends 40 crows to attack the scarecrow. And she sends bees out. Right, there's the symbol of magic again. And her slaves, she calls them the Winkies. And, of course, you got the flying monkey she summons with a golden cap of diamonds and rubies. And it talks about how the witch was scared of water. Kind of sad, right? She wouldn't go near Dorothy whenever Dorothy was bathing, and, you know, she made sure to never touch the water. Now, what's interesting, fun fact, not so fun fact, I guess, in the filming of Wizard of Oz, there were some pyrotechnics at this part where, uh, uh, the witch gets the, how about a little fire, Scarecrow? Right? And it actually burned the actress, Margaret Hamilton. She got secondary burns to the face. And then after that, they were like, okay, let's have your stunt double do it. That didn't work so well. And she also got some burns, right? I'm not playing around. So, we're almost there, folks. We're getting real close here. So they get back to Oz. They kill the witch. They get back to Oz with a broomstick. But then Oz is playing games. He's like, come back tomorrow. Again, more ritual stuff like Fight Club. Then they come back, and Oz, he's yelling at him. He's like, I'm the great and powerful. <laughs> he's a psychopath. And uh, But Toto, Toto knows what's up. Toto finds the curtain, pulls it back, and exposes Oz as just a little guy behind the curtain. Take a listen. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I yes. don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Well, Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. Well, what about the heart that you promised Tin Man? Well, and the courage that you promised Cowardly Lion? Well, I'm Scarecrow's brain. brain. Why, anybody can have a brain. That's a very mediocre commodity. Every pusillanimous creature that crawls on the earth or slinks through slimy seas has a brain. Back where I come from, we have universities, seats of great learning, where men go to become great thinkers. And when they come out, they think deep thoughts and with no more brains than you have. But they have one thing you haven't got, a diploma. Therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Universitatis Committee Artem E. Pluribus Unum, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of THD. <laughs> Ph.D.? Yeah, that's Doctor of Thinkology. The sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh, George, Rapture! I've got a brain! How can I ever thank you enough? Uh, well, you can't. As for you, my fine friend, you're a victim of disorganized thinking. You are under the unfortunate delusion that simply because you run away from danger, you have no courage. You're confusing courage with wisdom. Back when I come from, there we have men who are called heroes. Once a year, they take their fortitude out of mothballs and parade it down the main street of the city. And they have no more courage than you have. But they have one thing that you haven't got, a medal. Therefore, for meritorious conduct, extraordinary valor, conspicuous bravery against wicked witches, I award you the Triple Cross. You are now a member of the Legion of Courage. <laughs> Shucks, folks, I'm speechless. <laughs> As for you, my galvanized friend, you want a heart. You don't know how lucky you are not to have one. Hearts will never be practical until they can be made unbreakable. But I, I still want one. 
Back where I come from, there are men who do nothing all day but good deeds. They are called Philip... Uh, Philip uh, yes. Uh, good deed doers. And their hearts are no bigger than yours. But they have one thing you haven't got, a testimonial. Therefore, in consideration of your kindness, I take pleasure at this time in presenting you with a small token of our esteem and affection. And remember, my sentimental friend, that a heart is not judged by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. <sighs> Oh, it ticks. Listen, look, it ticks. Oh. Re read what my medal says. Courage. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? Oh, oh they're all wonderful. Hey, what about Dorothy? Yes, how about Dorothy? Yeah, uh, Dorothy next. Yeah, Dorothy. Uh... Oh, I don't think there's anything in that black bag for me. Well... You force me into a cataclysmic decision. The only way to get Dorothy back to Kansas is for me to take her there myself. Oh, will you? Could you? Oh. Oh, but are you a clever enough wizard to manage it? Child, you cut me to the quick. I'm an old Kansas man myself, born and bred in the heart of the Western wilderness. Premier Balloonist, par excellence, to the Miracle Wonderland Carnival Company, until one day, while performing spectacular feats of stratospheric skill, never before attempted by civilized man, an unfortunate phenomena occurred. The balloon failed to return to the fair. It did? Weren't you frightened? Frightened? You are talking to a man who has laughed in the face of death, sneered at doom, and chuckled at catastrophe. I was petrified. Then suddenly the wind changed, and the balloon floated down into the heart of this noble city, where I was instantly acclaimed Oz, the first wizard deluxe. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, indeed. The boys, the fellas, they get so mad. They're so mad they call Oz a humbug. A serious insult back in the 1930s. But then Oz, he, he finesses them. You know, this guy's slick. He, he gives them tchotchkes, and they fall for it. He gives uh he gives the scarecrow who wanted brains, he's like, here's a diploma, here's a degree. You know, arguably he's talking about how college is just a waste an indoctrination system, which I actually don't believe. Go to college, folks. <laughs> Maybe. College is for everybody, but you know. We could have that argument another time. Actually, I did have that argument with Josie on my other podcast, Breaking Social Norms. We had a whole college debate show. Uh when was it? Late twenty twenty two, so check that out. If you want to know what I think about college. And uh, yeah, he gives he gives the Scarecrow. But, but we already knew Scarecrow had a brain. Remember, he figured out how to chop down the chandelier. But the Scarecrow, he's like, oh, yeah. And he starts spitting out geometry formulas. He's bugging out. He's like, oh, yeah. You know, they totally fall for this. And then the lion gets a medal for bravery. And they compare it to uh, Oz compares it to this local parade. That he has some peons doing the city every month. Maybe drawing comparisons to the military even, right? Because the medal is a triple cross. And the Tin Man, he wants a ticking heart. And the Oz gives him this Flavor Flav heart clock. And all of a sudden they feel complete. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what this shows us is society filling the desires and the needs of the sheeple by, you know, patting them on the back while the elites maintain power. But Dorothy, remember, she wanted to go home. So Oz says, look, I'm going to take you back myself. I got this this Chinese surveillance hot air balloon. And <laughs> and he goes on to talk about how he had faced death himself on this balloon. He himself went on a death and rebirth rit ritual. He was the Osiris. And the universe, the universe's will sent this balloon that he was in to Oz. That's how he got there. And he landed on this balloon, and he became their leader. They call him the Wizard Deluxe. He was the fallen angel. He just duped them, though, because he's the king of finesse here, right? And he was like the that ancient alien theory of technological reference, the concept of the cargo cult. There were these islands that no one had been to forever. They were still living back in the freaking uh prehistoric days and here comes some world war ii planes landing and they were bugging out they were like whoa what is this these are the gods and they weren't 
It was just their technological frame of reference was wasn't at to the same speed, right? And recall that there is this, uh, you know, the Book of Enoch, and the the and remember the falling star on the Emerald City Gate. The the wizard blew in and completely made them believe all this stuff. Now, you could look at this. If you want to look at it from the Book of Enoch realm, um, it's interesting because, and I think we're going to get into this in part three, perhaps. I think I think we might need to. Um, the idea here, and yeah, we're going to cover this in part three. I think this would, I think this would fit better in part three. But let me give you a little taste. In the Book of Enoch, they talk about the Watchers. And my man, my man on uh, Patreon, John, I think it was John, he's the one that planted the seed, and, and it, it's going to manifest better in part three, but I'm going to give you a taste of what you're in for. In the book of Enoch, they talk about the Watchers, right? And the Watchers, they shared all these forbidden arts and sciences and these secret mysteries of the heavens with mankind. This is very, a Prometheus idea. Bestowing the wisdom upon man, the secrets of magic. And that's essentially what Oz is. Right, he is the Azazel. He's one of the Watchers. Anyway, we're going to talk about him in part three. Now, all of this, go they go through this whole thing, and Dorothy is like, "Okay, I'm get to finally go back to Kansas." But then, freaking stupid Toto jumps out, and she has to she misses out on the balloon ride to save Toto. And and Oz takes off in his balloon. He's out of there. Right. And the good witch comes by and she says, look, Dorothy, you could have went back to Kansas anytime you wanted to, but you had to go on this journey to figure that out. She had to find herself. This is the, the, the age old philosophy of the occultists or even the philosophers to know thyself in the platonic schools. And it's, we talked about this in the matrix. I did a matrix deep dive of matrix one, two, three, and four and the animatrix if you're on Patreon. And we talked about the philosophies here. Neo goes on a similar journey. So the uh so she says, look, you could have you could have done this the whole time, but you had to go on this journey in order to figure that out. You had to find out for yourself where your heart could lead. And she said, look, all you gotta do is click your heels and just keep repeating there's no place like home and boom, you got it. So she clips her heels three times, and three times of course is important in the occult. Going back to Pythagoras, the OG occultist. He said three is the mystical number of perfect harmony, which is where you see it in religions like Christianity as the Holy Trinity, or you see it in the occultist with the magic of the triangle of manifestation. But most of these ancient mystery schools have degrees based upon three. Like in the Free Masonic Blue Lodge, they do three three degrees. You got the entered apprentice, fellow craft, Master Mason. In the Scottish Rite of Freemason, you have 33 degrees, right? In Freemasonry, the entered apprentice is given the light, which is what Dorothy and crew are obsessing about when they walk into the Emerald City. There are three lesser lights and three greater lights, and the three lesser lights are the sun, the moon, and the lodge master. The sun and the moon, Osiris and Isis, again. And the greater lights are the volume of the sacred law, the square, and the compass. Now, magic is said to come in threes as well. Okay, in Wicca, they've got the rule of three, which says that whatever energy a person puts out, it comes back to them threefold. The concept of karma, right? So no matter what you believe, it doesn't hurt to keep positive energy, folks. Put out love. Put it out. And if the occultists are right, you'll get it back three times. And even if they're wrong, it makes the world a better place and makes you a better person. But you you got to align your frequencies with the path of Christ, of love. But anyway, Glinda, the witch, the whole time she's saying this, she's got a, a pentagram in her hand on the wand. Wishing upon a star indeed. And we come full circle... Dorothy wakes up back in her busted-ass black-and-white dust home. 
Again, black and white, symbol of duality. There's another one. Seen on the Freemasonic floors, the Moses pavement. It's a way for the initiate to consider the conscious mind and the subconscious mind going over the rainbow subconsciously. So Dorothy, she talks about how she's like, oh, I had a dream and I saw all these men's and and I went to Oz and parts of it were scary. Maybe she was in an MK Ultra altered state. I don't know. But that's how the film ends. <laughs> that's it. She comes back. What does it all mean? She went on the hero's journey. She is the Neo. She is the Alice in Wonderland. She got the call to adventure from the tornado. She leaves her ordinary world of Kansas. She crosses the threshold into the land of Oz, which you clearly see with Technicolor. She gets the supernatural mentorship from Glinda the Good Witch. She faces multiple trials and hardships along the way, learning more about herself, as do her friends. She goes into the inner sanctum of Oz. This is the underground realm to face death and returns with the boons. The boons for her are the gnosis of self back home in Kansas. Because at the start of the story, she hated it there, remember? But now she has gone on this journey to know thyself. And she's ready to come back a better person. So there you go. That's the whole movie. But wait, folks, there's more. (laughs) We're going to do part three next week. Stay subscribed to the show. All right. Part three, we're going to talk about what the whole thing was about. It's about opening up the minds, particularly of the youths, of the kids, to accept the occult truths. It's the evolution of consciousness. They want us all to take a part of the spiral, go down the yellow brick road. We're all going down the yellow brick road, like in Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. The initiate, the viewer, goes on a journey, the alchemical evolution of man. And we're all going to take part in it. So that's it. Stay subscribed to the show. Look, if you like the show, here's what I want you to do. Right? Call to action. I got, I, got a, I got a call to adventure for you. Go on Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. Please, please, for the love of God. I get haters on here. They hate everything about all this stuff. And if you like the show, if you love it, you want to keep it popping, you want to keep it... Because look, these algorithms, the, the dreaded AI algorithms, these uh, if I get the positive reviews, they, they show it to more people, and more people can see these ideas and wake up to the truth of what's going on in our world. It's a spiritual battle. Yes, that's right. I'm basically saying, if you don't put a five-star review, we're going to lose the spiritual battle to the devil. I mean, come on. <laughs> They're ridiculous. Anyway... Uh, or don't whatever I don't care stay subscribed till next time next week we're coming back with part three we're bringing the heat as always and until next time stay woke